I want to talk about my new Substack post. It's entitled How Democracy Ends, Why COVID-19 Provides a Roadmap to the End of America. This is something I've written. It's on my Substack feed. Check it out there. But let me walk you through the central argument. The central argument is over the last 18 months, many Western democratic nations have done things we've never done before. We've suspended freedom of movement. We've instituted passports to keep track of your whereabouts. They've been apps installed on phones. There has been military presence in the streets, like in Australia. And this article imagines what might happen in a future America over the course of the next five or 10 years where democratic norms fall out of favor. The first thing I'll say is that other people have commented and they say, well, there are other scenarios by which democracy can end. And I don't discount that. Of course, there are many scenarios by which democracy can end. Here I'm offering just one scenario based on the events of the last 18 months. What do I describe in this, in this substack? I talk about a typical cold and flu season. In a typical flu season, 40 to 60,000 people will die. As the population of America gets bigger, the flu season will probably have more casualties. So it is not unthinkable in the next 10 years that there will be a cold and flu season that is a little bit above average with 80,000 to 100,000 deaths. That will be a terrible thing, but it is likely quite possible. An unscrupulous politician may seize this as an opportunity. 100,000 deaths is more than average, and there may be a room to sort of institute um, brute force methods to control this. So what might happen? Imagine this 100,000 death flu season. There's going to be some hospital, some pocket in America, some region where a lot of cases all present at once. That's just the nature of respiratory viruses. It's a stochastic event. There'll be some place where a lot of people present at once. And there'll be hospitals that at best of times operate ICUs on the higher capacity side. And when they are hit with a deluge of flu patients, they will be overcrowding. They may even be overflow into other units. So they will be overwhelmed with this flu. And there will be sympathetic stories that the media can extol. There'll be teenagers, there'll be young kids who become very sick with the flu. And we do not want that, but some may even pass away. And so this, this politician in Washington may see this happening and see an opportunity. And that opportunity will be to instruct the governor of the state to issue a shelter-in-place warning. After all, that's what we should have done with SARS-CoV-2 earlier, they might say. They might say, that's what you asked me to do. In fact, many people on, on, on one political side have pushed for stronger restrictions. And so they will say, we'll have a shelter in place. We cannot tolerate the greater loss of life. And what might happen after that? The governor may implement it. They may have a shelter in place. This is something that we hadn't had in the past flu seasons, but we may have in the future. And there may still be flu patients presenting. It may be difficult to know the exact denominator and the exact numerator, but hospitals and even more hospitals, even more units may become overwhelmed with a prolonged hospitalization on the vent. There may be vent shortages in some counties. And this political leader will say, well, that's not enough. We haven't yet done enough. We're going to ask all the residents, they must be cheating, to install an app on their phone that tracks their movements, tracks their whereabouts. We cannot have greater casualties with the flu. And this may be an attempt for another two weeks. We'll try and see what happens. And of course, cases may still rise. That's the nature of respiratory viruses, despite these efforts. Or there may be another pocket slightly nearby that has an increase in cases. This leader might say, <clears throat> this is not working. We are failing, and so we need to step it up a notch. We need to put the military in the street. And in fact, that's what happened in Australia. The military presence was used to enforce lockdowns and shutdowns. And that may be what happens in this country. They'll say, we'll send to the National Guard. We'll partner with the, the governor, but we will put the military in the streets. And then the last piece of the puzzle, the media will continue to cover this, but there will inevitably be some opposition. There'll be some people who say, you know, just how bad is this? Is this really atypical? Is this within realm of normalcy? What about other hospitals that aren't overwhelmed? And this leader can say, you know what? We're going to have to censor all that speech. That speech is dangerous. It leads to death. It leads to people not taking this seriously. It's misinformation. And so we're going to move into social media offices and we're going to shut down these speakers. We're not going to allow this kind of speech. And in fact, you asked for it. You asked for it the last time. You wanted us to do more of this and now we're going to do it. You wanted more shutdowns. You wanted more censoring. We're giving you what you want. And then finally, the elections. The elections may near, and the future leader may say, you know what? The Constitution prohibits me from moving the date of the presidential election, but it doesn't specify how the electors are chosen. And I'm going to may ask the governors to make an exemption and change the way we picked electors and not do a direct popular vote this year. It's too risky. And in fact, we're just going to have to go with electors that are handpicked. And they're going to pick me. This is a scenario of events that might possibly happen. I'm not saying it will happen. I'm just saying it's not out of the realm of possibility. And every piece of this puzzle, every step along the way has been paved by 
our attitudes towards these policies. One, strong force, including military force, has been deployed in other nations, including Australia. And there have been calls for stronger force to have been applied in this country. Two, the public has accepted severe restrictions on movement, on on travel, on border closures. We've accepted that in the past. Um, and some have even said that greater restrictions should have been applied. Three, the media. The media has never been good at portraying risk as a numerical quantity and comparing it to other risks. They're much better at giving you anecdotes to have a gut feeling of risk. But anecdotes can be misleading. And of course, in any above average flu season, you can have very powerful anecdotes. In fact, in any below average flu season, you can have powerful anecdotes showing how bad the flu is. The rise of social media corporations has led to a few places where most speech, most dialogue is happening. And those places can be regulated or taken over. Five, America is increasingly comfortable with regulating speech. We didn't see this among people on the progressive left 20 years ago, but now we see a strong appetite to regulate speech that is thought to be harmful to the public health. And the sixth point, I think, is that the idea of safety as a virtue above all other virtues dominates the consciousness now. We think safety is the greatest virtue in life. It is the safetyism movement that we've seen over the last 20 years, and that means that you can do unprecedented things to liberty in pursuit of a greater virtue, safety. And finally, point seven, it's the party that asked for doing more that is more vulnerable to take over from the other party. Whatever nation you're in, if there were two political parties and one party wanted more restrictions, more curtailments, more prohibitions, and the other party didn't, it's that party that didn't that can leverage this in the future and, and provide it as a basis of taking over. They can say, you were the ones who wanted this. We're giving you what you want and use it in a nefarious way. So the purpose of my Substack post is not to say this is what's going to happen. It's not to say this is the only end to democracy, which is what some people have said. It's not that. It's to say that we have allowed a number of precedents in place that make us extremely vulnerable to this sort of seizing of power. The use of something out there that will provide a real risk, but that risk will be distorted. It will be told in anecdotes rather than numerical, and it will warrant a severe restriction on freedom, on movement, and on communication. And once those three pillars are, are cut out from under you, uh, the potential to lose democratic norms is very high. And the one thing I point out is that this may seem so unthinkable, but of course, in the 1920s in Germany, it was a democratically elected place, and it was a series of events and detailed in a number of elegant World War II books that led to the rise of totalitarianism. It's not out of the question that simple events, serendipity, opportunity lead to the end of democratic norms. I guess I'm concerned about this. I'm concerned that we have not had an honest discussion about what limits, if any, need to exist, what checks and balances need to exist as we pursue public health, which I believe is incredibly important, but as we balance that with the potential for misuse and abuse and political preferences and power usurping the public goal and the public benefit. And I think I think uh, we're as vulnerable as we've ever been based on what's happened. So I encourage you to check out, linked below, my Substack post. And if you like this video, like, subscribe, comment, leave a message. Until next time.